Uh, so Jacopo has just started recording. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to present uh, our webinar speaker, Felipe Queiroz. Uh, he's a uh, he has recently established a laboratory uh, in uh, George Tech and the Emory University. Uh, since two years, if I correctly remember, uh, his uh, team has been studying, addressing problems of uh, uh, self-assembly of uh, biopolymers and their role and uh, possible applications in bioengineering systems and uh, biology in general. Uh, in today's talk, uh, Filippo will tell us about his uh, research uh, and results related uh, to liquid-liquid phase separation mechanism in uh, such systems uh, and uh, skin, right? All right, Filippo, I will concede the stage to you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Roman. I really appreciate the invitation to to speak to you guys, and I'm excited to interact and um, show show with you guys some of the work that we've been doing over the last actually 10 years now, uh, dissecting liquid liquid separation questions in both engineering and biological systems. Um, and the focus of my work and, and my lab is, is really self-assembly of intrinsic cholesterol proteins. And so as you know, proteins come in many different flavors, but we really focus on, on proteins that are unable to assume a defined three-dimensional structure. So if you run multiple simulations, they really do not style with the same three-dimensional structure. And we're interested in those proteins because they really, they really excel at undergoing a transition from a solute state to an insoluble state in a similar responsive manner. And because we have full access to the molecular architecture of these proteins by encoding, encoding them genetically, we can then program their self-assembly into very defined structures through making use of this phase separation during assembly. And so this interest in phase separation during assembly is particularly striking in the context of proteins because of the vastness of the, of the proteinogenic world. It's, it's really dramatic how expansive of a system it is, and it is almost daunting, but also exciting to be able to explore this concept of properties in such a diverse system. And we're, and we're really thinking about it in the context of protein-based materials, so how can we then harness this kinds of phase separation during assembly processes to control nanostructure assembly, uh, with biomedical applications in mind. So here, for instance, we have nanoparticles that either assume a nanoparticle a, a warm type morphology or nanoparticles that assume a spherical morphology. And more recently, we've been thinking about how this phase separation during assembly might be playing a role in the context of the assembly of tissues or the properties of tissues, uh, particularly we've been interested in the skin. But we, before I go into the details of, of our work uh, dealing with nanomaterials and, and, and this process of phase separation in living tissues, let me back up a little bit and, and just drive you through you know, how we might be thinking about this process in the context of cells and, and the context of biology. And so, you know, as I mentioned, these are proteins that will go from a soil to an insoluble state in response to the number of stimuli that can be temperature or enzymes, pH, but of course also concentration. And so if you think of the cytoplasm and you have any of these proteins being soluble under certain conditions, you might think that at some point, if the conditions are met, they might be able to undergo these kinds of phase separation events so that they would demix from the complex milieu of the cytoplasm forming very defined compartments within the cell, even without the need for a membrane. And so it's become apparent now over the last few years uh, that there are many structures within the cell. And here I just highlight a few, like the nucleus in the nucleus, for instance, where we know these kinds of structures within the cell do not have membranes, and yet they're very, very stable. Um, but I think a turning point for cell biology and, and the intersection with the biophysics of phase separation really came back 2009 with the pioneering work of uh, Tony Heimann and Cliff Brownwin, uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, where they, they look at germ glands in C. elegant embryos. And what they observed was if they were to squeeze these embryos uh, between two glass lights, these germ granules would start flowing in the span of seconds as if they were liquids. And so it got people thinking about these membraneless organelles within cells, not necessarily as, as odd, but as potential really exciting structures within the cell that would have unique material properties like these liquid-like behaviors. And so it got people thinking about, you know, how could that be interpreted by the cell to program into some cellular mechanisms. Excuse me, Felipe. Um, I don't know if we could do something about it. Uh, uh, people uh, in the chat saying that your slides are pixelated. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I must say mm. that there is sort of a difficulty to read the uh, captions and the figures. Uh, do you know what? I wonder, it if it has, I wonder if it has to do with the video sharing format. Let's see if. 
let's see if I stop sharing and do not optimize for video, if that improves it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, because I haven't optimized for video before. This is a, uh... Does it look better now? Yes, actually, yeah, yes, yes. Interesting, so it's, it's, it's the optimization for video that is messing it up. So we'll see, when I play a video first, I'll ask you how good the quality of the video is so that we stop it. All and right. please, please warn me if there are questions in the chat because I don't have the chat on my, on my screen. Um, and so, you know, this turning point back in 2009, really a pioneering science paper, I got people thinking about liquid liquid behaviors within sales. Um, and it really got a lot of traction. And over the last five years, seven years, uh, there's been really a lot of excitement and, uh, around interpreting these kinds of phase separation events in the cell in very intriguing mechanisms like, you know, microRNA immediate silencing, heat shear response, the assembly of heterochromatin, the sensing of DNA inside the cell, the spin drone assembly, uh, the assembly of genomic enhancers, and more recently, uh, emerging roles in tissue biology, particularly the junction assembly, and as I was explaining in my own work, uh, skin barrier formation. Um, and so really, this idea of, of how phase separation driven processes might be playing a role inside cells is, is really touching a lot of different aspects of biology at this point. Here is an outline of my talk, however. Um, I'll begin with discussing some of the uh, efforts that we made over the years to learn how to encode phase separation in intrinsic disorder proteins or so-called IDPs. Um, and then I'll move on to how that work then enables our ability to, to develop exquisite ways to examine these behaviors in tissues, particularly in the context of skin. And I'll finish up with, with I think, what, uh, what it's gonna become a, a frontier for the field, which is to understand not necessarily the equilibrium processes that, that underlie phase separation, but you know, perhaps more excitingly now, the non-equilibrium aspects of this uh, process is too. So to begin, let me just clarify what I mean by, by phase separation behavior. And there are two different flavors that you need to be aware of. And, and they're, for sure known as LCST or UCST phase separation behavior. LCST stands for lower critical solution temperature and UCST for upper critical solution temperature, but it'll become clear in just a second. Think of two different polymers. So polymer A and polymer B. And here what I'm plotting is the dependence of this interaction parameter on temperature. And for polymer A, if you heat, the interaction between these polymers is winding down, is decreasing. But, but for polymer B, if you increase the temperature, the interaction parameter is going up. So that has a consequence in terms of phase separation. For the polymer A, because interaction parameter is decreasing with temperature, you end up with this kind of phase diagram in which above a new CST or upper critical solution temperature, there's only one phase. But below that, there are strong interactions because that, that interaction parameter is strong and it leads to phase separation. The opposite is true for LCST. There is a lower critical solution temperature above which there are two phases because interaction parameter has increased. But below that, there's only one phase. There's no phase separation happening. Now, the building of, of, of phase diagrams to really understand LCST or UCC behavior is complicated. We've taken a very simple approach in which we, act, we simply look at uh, cloud points. So imagine here a solution having a polymer at a given concentration, and we simply try to trade the temperature. So we change temperature of the solution, measure absorbance or turbidity, and what we can detect in those cases is that it's a sharp transition from a soluble state, so no absorbance, to a, an insoluble state that give us, gives us this scattering of the light. And the opposite is true for LCST and UCST. So you can see that for LCST, these polymers will become insoluble as you increase temperature, whereas for UCST, these polymers are gonna become soluble as you increase the temperature. So we're not necessarily determining full phase act, but we're looking at these cloud point temperatures. But how do you then you know, start understanding how to encode these behaviors into proteins? The, as I mentioned, the proteinogenic world is fascinating, but it's also vast and hard to span. And so what we've done is really taken an engineering approach in which we come up with, a, I think, a, a a clever approach, which is to look at repetitive proteins. So these are intrinsic proteins with a simple repetitive architecture in which we take motifs that are based on a, a, an architecture composed of proline residues and glycine residues that are spaced by a number of other residues. And for those of you who are not so familiar with, with proteins, proline and glycine are two amino acids that are well known to be disruptive of secondary structure in proteins. So with this, we were hoping that we would end up with a blank slate polymers that were IDP in nature because of this proline and glycine being present, but with sufficient space in between those kinds of punctuation marks that would allow us to then span this sequence space so that we could change amino acid composition, but at the same time change syntax. So even for a fixed amino acid composition, then it starts changing the order of those amino acids. And we built many, many of these kinds of polymers over the years 
um, again, spanning this problem of glycine with different kinds of uh, spacings um, and with composition so that we would span very hydrophobic sequences or very hydrophilic sequences, again, to sort of introduce new flavors of interactions into this blank state of disorder uh, IDPs. And with that, excuse uh, me, uh, may be precise in the previous slide. So uh, basically, you fix uh, the pro end and glee end. Yes. And inside this XN would be various uh, combinations uh, of N. Uh, yeah. So you can see, for instance, down here we split spaces. by no spacing, n equals zero, n equals one, n equals two, three to four. And these are just amino acids that we now can add in. And inside it's it's acids, be, between pro and glee module exactly uh, exactly uh, residues okay and, and then you. there are many copies and then there are many copies of each of these motifs so we then play with the length and i'll, I'll show you just in that in that a second in that that is the that is the syntax of the individual repeat unit and then we can make however many repeats we want but okay. it's a very simple way to keep the structure disordered and allows us to introduce different kinds of interactions by different flavors of amino acids into that blank slate and we first show that it's a very robust blank slate. So if, if you know, this is a sample of the different employees that we made. And at room temperature, if you look at cyclodecorism, which is a very simple way to look at a disorder, this is a typical sort of a spectrum that you would see for, for a disorder protein. And so no matter what kinds of spacings between proline and glycine we had, or what kinds of things we added, we would always end up with a disorder protein. So that was good for us. But the interesting thing really came in that, depending on the class of amino acids that we introduced, we were able to, find a broad range of LCST behaviors. So here you have, you know, all the way from 80 Celsius to 30 Celsius. And so that repeat length of these motifs as we make different lengths of these proteins would also tune that behavior. So really ready to tune our LCST type behavior. And the same was true for UCST type, where depending on the interaction that we introduced, we were able to actually span a wide range of UCST cloud points, again, using a molecular way to tune or repeat number to tune that behavior, but also composition. And although I don't have to go over the details of, 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 the, of the heuristics or the rules that we uncover, largely we should say that for LCST, whenever we introduce hydrophobic interactions or pure hydrophobic interactions, these polymers will exhibit LCST type behavior. But whenever we introduce cation pi, charge charge, hydrophobic, and precisely a combination of those, we would end up with polymers that would exhibit UCST behavior. And I should clarify that all of these measurements were done in, in simple false phase buffer, uh, buffers. Um, and so they're actually sort of physiological uh, buffers. And like a lot of the, of the work that have been done in synthetic polymer literature in which those were usually done in, in, in under the conditions that were not physiological. So we're interested in trying to understand the behavior of the proteins in conditions that were close to physiological. And I encourage you to look at this nation materials paper which summarizes some of those heuristics. And so the exciting thing for us was that at the beginning of a lot of these efforts, we knew very little about how to sort of go over this sequence space of amino acids to program these behaviors. But after a lot of this effort, we, we realized that there was a large sequence space that we could expand to encode these behaviors, both LCST and UCST, even, even there would be regions in which those behaviors would start interacting. And that was exciting to us because it pointed to the fact that in this humongous space, there had to be native or naturally occurring IDPs that perhaps were fulfilling all of those sequence requirements. So we began to write our heuristics as simple rules, as simple scripts that we could plug into our search of the proteomes to identify new IDPs that might have this, this interesting phase separation behaviors. And that led to a prediction. One of our first predictions was uh, an interesting protein named filagrin that we thought had all the requirements to exceed with UCST type phase separation behavior. And here is a snapshot of what that protein looks like. It's, it's highly repetitive. So R indicates repeat one, repeat two, repeat three. So very repetitive architecture, similar to what we had before in the polymers that we were uh, making. Uh, but if you look at this plot of disorder, uh, you'll see that the blue domain is, is, is the only the order domain. All the structure, of the, the, the other domains of the protein are, are here at one, which is uh, you know, basically fully disordered, expected to be fully disordered. So very intriguing architecture, but also low complexity. So the entire composition of the protein is dictated by only a handful of amino acids. And we particularly were intrigued by the presence of histidines, this H. This histidine is, is, is one potential source of those uh, cation pi and pi pi interactions that we know were important for UCSC. And not only that, but they were really, really large proteins. So both in the mouse or in humans, we knew that these were among the largest proteins in those proteomes, which we thought was important to encode a potent phase separation behavior based on what we knew about phase separation behavior at that point. 
And most intriguingly to us, uh, this pertains do contain a lot of charged residues, but they're exclusively biased towards arginine residues. So there are two uh, naturally occurring positively charged amino acids, arginine and lysine. And these proteins has never used lysine. They just prefer to use arginine, which we knew was important to encode phase separation behavior and the physiological conditions. And not only this was true for filagrin in different species, but these proteins that I'm listing here, filagrin 2, RPTN, hornary, and tracohyaline, these are paralogs of filagrin. So these are proteins that are in the same genome loss, genome loss I as filagrin, and they are supposed to be closely related in function to filagrin. So not only are we seeing that filagrin is fulfilling these conditions for being a CST type, but we think that other proteins in the skin are also built like that. So it really got us thinking about, wow, this could be a really interesting uh, protein to study to start uncovering a potential role for phase separation in, in, in a tissue, um, in a mammalian tissue. So this brings me back to my outline. So I already told you just a very quick overview of our efforts to sort of sample the sequence space of, of amino acids to uncover phase separation in IDPs. And now I just told you how we're now pivoting into thinking about using this knowledge of how to encode phase separation in IDPs to then uncover phase separation behaviors in, 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 in exciting biological systems and I'll focus on skin. And it was exciting to us because there was already some exciting work from the genetics field suggesting that mutations in this particular protein, filagrin, were strongly associated with skin barrier disorders, particularly one known as atopic dermatitis. And these mutations are nonsense. Nonsense means truncating mutations, so essentially stop codons that appear. And these mutations are all over the place, but the most common mutations are, 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 are towards the end terminus of the protein. Um, and these mutations, again, lead to where it's strongly associated with this disease, like the dermatitis, the skin doesn't look normal. Um, it's highly environmentally dependent, which was intriguing to us because I mentioned that face separation behavior is very similarly dependent. And so people uh, with this disorder, when they go to cold or dry environments, their skin is not happy. The functional def defect, however, was unclear at the time of this work. Uh, and we suspected that perhaps liquid liquid phase separation and defects in, in the behavior of this uh, protein filagrin might be implicated. So where is filagrin then? You know, that was kind of the next obvious questions for us. And, and let me just work you through what skin looks like. And so here is uh, stem cells of the skin of the epidermis. And these cells uh, like to move toward the, towards the surface of the skin. And they, as they do so, they differentiate and, and they form different layers. Uh, they're called the spinous layer, the granular layer, and then the corneum is the surface of the skin at the very top. Uh, what was intriguing though is that this, this layer known as a granular layer was known as such because of the presence of these KGs or keratohyaline granules, which I depict in red. And these keratohyaline granules is exactly where filagrin was known to reside. So here now we had a, a, a case where we predicted UCSC type phase behavior. We look at the, at the literature and we find that the protein is actually residing in, in really intriguing membranous granules within the skin. And this is what it looks like in, in TEM. Um, this is the part of the skin that determines the better function of the skin. You've got the granular layer with these black deposits that account for these catrohaline granules, and then you have the corneum. So very static view. People didn't really know what these granules uh, did in skin, and, and we thought that it was a really interesting system to study and perhaps uncovered an interesting role for phase separation in biology. Uh, and to give you just a, an overview of what's, going, of what's coming, uh, this is a technology that we developed to then go from this static view to then be able to do dynamic studies of how this process is happening in the skin. So we developed this technology known as phase separation sensors. And what I'm showing you here is a view, a confocal microscopy view of the skin looking from the top down. The microscope is kind of on the surface of the skin. And I'll, as I play this video, you'll see that over the span of about half a day, a lot of these compartments or granules within the cell disappear to then lead way to the formation of the surface of, of, of the corneum in the skin surface. Um, Roman, is the video pro, uh, displaying properly? Yes, yes, video is running. Okay, and awesome. we see. Great. So just to give you an overview of what's coming, uh, you know, these are kind uh, of the questions. Sorry, that Felipe, could you, could you repeat the video? Because I'm not sure it runs. It runs uh, uh, yes. Uh, could you point to what are the granules, uh, these green uh, so, balls? So, yes. So the face separation sensor, this is an image from the top down uh, through confocal microscopy. The face separation sensor is localized into a keratohyaline granules. And I'll explain that uh, a little later in more detail. But what you'll see is that over the span of about half a day, we're seeing tremendous remodeling of those structures within the cell as the granular cells transition to the corneum. And I'll go into more detail. I just want to give you a, a, a sort of uh, a little peek into what's coming. 
So we see how this uh, green uh, granules uh, smear out. Uh, that's uh, this exactly. That's where uh, yeah. the liquid liquid uh, separation stops, <laughs> right? Exactly. So what I'm okay. trying to suggest is that we went we you know at the end of this talk we realized that we went from having this static view in which we knew very little about these calcium granules and how they were important to skin biology to then developing now this dynamic view of what's happening through the lens of phase separation. But I'll, again, I'll go into the details of how we did that and, and what we actually uncovered. Okay. But so these are some of the questions that we had. Uh, we know these granules were present in the skin, uh, but you know, what are the material properties? Were they liquid-like, as perhaps will be suggested by the UCST, the UCST behavior of, of, that we predicted for filagrin? Uh, were they storing things? Uh, how were they interacting with other organelles within the cell? Uh, what is the composition? Uh, some, some very fundamental biophysical questions, and then, of course, uh, more that deal with the mechanisms. Um, and, and we approach this work in two parts. In the first part, we took a very sort of engineer approach in which we said, let's just tag filagrin itself or variants of that filagrin to probe the architecture of the protein and its phase separation behavior, particularly with regards to the mutations that we saw in patients. And in the second part was, okay, but how can we move this work from these simple systems to the skin itself? And so we had to come up with a strategy that we call phase separation sensors to then be able to uncover a lot of these processes in the endogenous skin tissue without perturbing the endogenous process. So trying to get as physiological as possible by looking directly at the skin as it's being developed. So in the first part, uh, you know, is a very simple engineering approach. We basically make genes encoding for different uh, kinds of repetitive proteins that look like filagrin. So this R8 is a sequence taken from human filagrin, the, the eighth repeat which looks very much like the 10 and the eight and the seven and the six because they're very, very similar in composition. But we can make many copies of those repeats and at any iteration of this assembly process, we can add different non-repeat domains. So we can add fluorescent proteins to be able to follow their behavior with fluorescence. We can add this S100 domain that I mentioned is the only structural part of the protein at the very end terminus, which was already known to be a dimerization domain. And, and these are really large uh, genes that we need to build, uh, but we succeeded in building those uh, about 16, 17 kilobases in size, uh, fairly large. But here's the actual data and, and what we think is interesting. So here's a protein in which we are fusing a red protein, a red fluorescent protein, MRFP, with one of our engineering constru constructs in which we have n copies of this repeat eight unit from human filagrin. And we're gonna assess the phase separation propensity of these constructs inside the cell from anywhere from one repeat of this R8 multi, uh, domain to 12 repeats, which is the full length of filagrin. And we're playing a really interesting uh, genetic trick as well to be able to be quantitative. And what we're doing here is we're using a, a signal that is coming from, from, from viruses to be able to couple the expression at the translational level of two different constructs. And so for every MRFP R8 molecule that we make, we're also gonna make one copy of these chromatin protein bound to GFP so that we can visualize uh, the nucleus well and for every molecule of this we'll have a molecule of the MRFPR8. And so here's what it looks like in the cell. For N equal one, if we express this in keratinocytes, these are the cells of the skin, in culture, uh, you'll see that the, the red signal, the magenta signal is diffusing the cytoplasm, there's no phase separation. Um, if we have even two copies of, of this, and this is again at the same concentration level, we're using the GFP signal in the nucleus to judge concentration. Uh, we also don't see signs of phase separation. These molecules are diffusing the cytoplasm. But as long as you get to four repeats of that uh, RA domain, now you start seeing some signs of phase separation. Some cells would exhibit signs of phase separation. And now when you go to eight repeats, you basically always see signs of phase separation, at least at this concentration. But this is all shown at a fixed concentration, so I can also do these experiments over a wide range of concentrations, and this is what it looks like. And, and it also gaze, uh, uh, taking a, a peek at the critical concentration for phase separation inside the cell. So here, what I'm showing you is Excuse anywhere me. from. Can, can you explain how, what is the so phase separation as a person? What does it measure? Uh, how do you measure that measures that measures the percentage of the signal? in a given cell that is within, residing within a granule or within a phase separated domain. So how much of the signal total within a cell is residing within this phase separated compartment? So okay. like here, for instance, there is nothing within that we distinguish as being phase separated. Yes. Here, only 14% of the signal is to, our, to what we can judge being phase separated. Here, 
basically Everything. the entire signal. Yes, rate. yes, thank you. And when we do that over a range of concentrations, we get a sense of the, of the actual phase separation behavior. So take a look at this. For n equal one, so the data in, in black, this is concentration on the x-axis. So different cells expressing different levels of these proteins. And even if a cell expresses a lot, there is basically no cell that we can detect with signs of phase separation. And this is true for n equal two as well, here shown in red. But once you go to n equal four, as I showed you before, then we see some cells that when they express a lot of the protein, we do see a strong signs of phase separation. And the steepness of this, of this transition increases as you go to n equal eight and n equal 12. So for proteins that are as large as what we see in humans, which have anywhere from 10 to 12 repeats of these domains, we see that phase separation is very, very likely to occur at very low concentrations. Now, what I'm showing you here is, is just copies of R8, but I also mentioned this blue domain, which I said is the only structured part of the normal protein that we find in humans. And that protein was known to be dimerizing uh, in a calcium dependent manner. And so we decided to also test that. And the reason why it's important to look at the domains without it is because we also knew that in the process of skin differentiation, this domain is cleaved. So although it's cleaved and we wanna know how it behaves when it's absent, we also wanted to know what happens when it's first made and it's attached and, and it hasn't been cleaved yet. And what we can see in those cases is that cells that don't, that still have that S100 domain, that is structural part of the protein, if you look at N equal two, for N equal two in red, so no, no S100 domain, there is basically no phase separation. But if you add this 100 domain now in purple, you see a slight sign of phase separation. So not very much happening. But if you go to n equal four, so in, in gray, in blue first, you have no S100 domain. There is like mild phase separation propensity. But if you add this 100 domain now in, in gray for n equal four, you see that it's a much sharper phase separation behavior. So the S100 domain, when we add it, it does increase the propensity for phase separation, which makes sense to us because initially when the protein is made, you know, the protein needs to undergo phase separation, but most likely then it gets cleaved at a time when it's no longer needed. Now we can quantify this specifically to know how much the protein is needed to get quantitative. And so here in N equal 12 is what a normal human would expect uh, would have. And we, we see that as little as one micromolar, 1.6 micromolar of this protein is sufficient uh, to heat this threshold of concentration to undergo phase separation. But for someone with a mutation that would cleave the protein to say have only two repeats, even if it has an S100 domain, the critical concentration now goes to almost two millimolar. So basically you have to make so much of this protein, it no longer really exhibits phase separation behavior. Or we, we predict that a person with a mutation that then leaves such a small protein wouldn't have really the ability to, to, uh, to trigger phase separation within, within those cells. Now, how about the behavior of these uh, granules uh, that are formed by filagrin? So here's a cell. Uh, and we have a granule uh, that is formed by uh, filagrin, which is stuck with MRFP. And, um, and we want to know the dynamics of that protein within the granule. So these are very large proteins, you know, about 400 kilodaltons in size, all the way to 500 kilodaltons in size. And we can do photobleaching experiments where when we bleach this particular granule, only 13 seconds later, we begin seeing that the, the signal has recovered. So there's a lot of mixing happening, even though these proteins are very large and moving very quickly. If we quantify that, uh, so you see here, this is a bleaching event. There's a loss of fluorescence, but on the span of a few seconds, you see that it's perfect recovery. So these dynamics that are happening within the granules are really indicative of some sort of very liquid-like dynamics. Now, the mutation that we see in humans, when you go from having you know, many repeats like we see in humans to having very few repeats, of course, as you shrink in this, they shrink the protein because these are truncating mutations, the liquid-like dynamics that we then can measure with FRAP are, are affected because these are diffusion processes that are molecular size dependent. But how about, you know, what are they actually doing inside the cell? So here's an image of cells that we uh, engineered to express some of these constructs. Um, and what I want you to focus on is in this region. Uh, I'm gonna play a video over this, you know, image in every two minutes to give you a sense of how these uh, granules behave inside the cell. And so I'm playing the video now, and I want you to see what happens when these granules collapse. And they're like droplets of water inside the cell that then and they keep undergoing fusion events. So, indicative of, of some of the signs of a phase of, of liquid-like behavior that have been described in the literature, and in line with the very rapid mixing dynamics that I just showed you through FRAP. And although here we were imaging at every two minutes, so not very high resolution because we're trying to avoid phototoxicity, whenever we capture these with uh, you know, millisecond resolution, if here at time zero there are two grounds that are about to uh, collapse, 
only sec six seconds later, I mean, th there is really nice fusion uh, that is happening. So these, these fusion dynamics are very fast. Um, so we can use uh, a little better tools. Uh, and in this case, we turn to uh, atomic form, form microscopy to probe the mechanical responsiveness and the liquid light behavior of these granules. And so here, what I'm showing you is, is, is a granule inside the cell uh, that is labeled with a GFP here, shown in white. And we're dropping an AFM probe from the top. And we're very gently tapping on these granules. So here I'm playing the video to show you how they respond mechanically. And we're doing this very gently to be able to measure the stiffness of the cell uh, surroundings around that granule. And we can do this for, for many different flavors of, of, of constructs. And we can map the, the stiffness of the cell plasma and the stiffness directly in the vicinity of the granule. And it was intriguing to us that for the constructs that are, we consider wild type um, and that are really processed to lack the center domain, they're very, very, you know, not very stiff. But whenever they actually retain this 600 domain, again, the, the domain that is known to be processed, uh, they become very stiff. So this really pointed to us that uh, a potential explanation to why in the normal differentiation program of the skin, you may want to get rid of the 600 domain soon after the assembly has happened because otherwise the stiffness of these granules increases rapidly. But instead of tapping gently, we can also tap uh, strongly. So here's an example where we take the AFM probe, here is a granule that is fairly spherical in shape. But when we tap strongly, we begin deforming the granule so that it eventually, in, in the span of only a few seconds, it flows around the nucleus as if it was a liquid. So again, pointing to these liquid light behaviors that we were excited about based on the imaging studies that we did previously. So just to summarize this first part, um, based on these studies, we, we were confident that the, the truncated mutations that we, we were seeing in humans were likely speaking to drastic changes in the critical concentration for phase separation and that the architecture of these proteins, both the SNR domain and the domain that I didn't have time to talk about on the, on the, end, on the tail domain, uh, are likely to be governing the specific material properties. I mentioned the stiffness of the granules as they are tuned to, to, to accomplish the biological function. And at least in, in the context of the cells uh, in vitro experiments that we did and in culture, uh, these granules do appear to have the liquid light behaviors that, that we were excited about. There is a question. Uh, yes. Within the granules, uh, do they chemically aggregate or do they just uh, stay in close proximity? Uh, so do the granules aggregate into large uh, droplets, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. So what I just showed you in, in the video earlier was a cell with multiple um, granules. And whenever they were running into each other, there will be a, a rapid fusion event. So in that case, there's coalescence. And so they're growing through that fusion or coalescence process. So they, they essentially grow through that. Uh, I'll show you later that what we ended up discovering in the context of the actual tissue in the skin is very, very different. And so it really points to the importance of uh, probing phase separation in their native uh, cellular environment. But at least in the context of these in vitro systems in, in cell culture, these engineer constructs that form uh, keratohyaline light granules, they do grow primarily through fusion events or coalescence. Now, how do you then go forward and start studying this process in the context of the skin? Now, I just show you, what I just showed you is essentially this. We can have a cell that if we have a phase transition protein like filaguin and we know how to tag it, like I did with RFP in my previous examples, then it's easy to visualize what's going on. As, a, as soon as the, pro, the protein gets expressed, there will be phase separation happening. But we already excuse knew me, that, that excuse was me. Uh, Yeah, there, 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 there was a refinement to the question. I mm -hmm. did not get it right. So I mean, uh, Anjan asks, uh, he meant, uh, do the proteins chemically aggregate inside the granules? Oh, ah, that's interesting. So uh, well, what I was showing you earlier with the fluorescent recovery of the photo bleaching experiments is that within those granules, uh, for as long as we can see those cells, if we do these photo bleaching experiments, you can see this very rapid dynamics, this rapid mixing. Um, and so based on those kinds of studies, my answer to your question would be that they're existing in a very amorphous, highly dynamic state. So uh, I wouldn't describe it necessarily as an aggregate within those granules, rather they're in a very sort of weakly interacting state uh, that allows them to exhibit this liquid like dynamics. So it's, it's a very interesting material state, but it's definitely not a solid like aggregate, rather it's more like a liquid. Thank you. At least in that context. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, so that here's the issue. If you look at a cell, so again, it's easy to probe these behaviors if you tag the protein that you suspect exhibits phase separation behavior. That's what I just did for filagrin in the context of the previous experiments. But we know that wasn't ideal. In fact, 
when we already quantify phase separation behavior for filaggin, and depending on the kind of protein that we use for tagging, we would see different behaviors. So more or less the conclusions were strong and robust, but we knew that the kind of tagging was affecting our conclusions. And so we didn't want that approach to be able to move into skin. And we thought that new tools were important to develop. So here is a tool that we proposed. What we thought of maybe it was possible to think of a phase separation sensor. This is a protein that we thought would be soluble in the cell. So here we have time zero. There is no expression of, of this native IDP, but our sensor is already expressed. And after 60 minutes, when the native IDP becomes expressed, then our sensor will be able to sort of signal that there is a change in phase separation behavior because it would then partition into those emerging uh, grams or compartments. And the rationale for our design was that based on our knowledge of how to encode phase separation behavior in IDPs, we should be able to encode really weak, ultra weak phase separation specific interactions that then would allow us to detect these phase separation dynamics. And um, I don't have a lot of time to go into the details of how we went about this, but I'll just give you a flavor for it. So here is R8, uh, the, the same repeat from Filagin that I showed you earlier. And, and the thought was rather simple. It was, let's think of ways to tune the phase separation propensity of R8. And so we came up with a different number of designs. But the important uh, concept here is identity percentage. So we're doing this in a way that we're rapidly going away from the original repeat sequence. So the repeat identity between R8 and say four and six is only 20%. So essentially these new constructs are very different, but they have a relationship to the original sequence and in composition, and their phase separation propensity is different. And to these domains, we can add lab imaging tags, different kinds of fluorescent proteins, and, and, and I won't talk about this, but we can also add more tools. And, and these are the two designs that we came up with. Sensor, I call them sensor A and sensor B. This is the architecture, just a fluorescent protein that is green. And one of these domains, the, the, the one and four and six here. The interesting thing to note here is that the identity between these two, so sensor A and sensor B, if I compare sensor A and sensor B at the sequence level, they're not identical to each other. They're very different in their sequence. The composition is similar, their sequence is very different. Now, why is this important? How does it work? So here's a cell that expresses filagin that is tagged. So this is kind of just like benchmarking the system. If I were to simply add a fluorescent protein to one repeat of filagin, I think that could be a sensor of some sort. Well, notice that this GFP signal does co-localize with the signal from filagin, but it does so very poorly. So the partition coefficient, the measure of the abundance inside or outside of the compartment is fairly low. Um, and we knew that this wasn't good enough to be able to move into skin. But if I show you how sensor A behaves, our optimized sensor, here is a cell with filagin express and also our sensor. Now notice that the partition coefficient is exquisite. So about 25 times inside versus outside. So really very sensitive to be able to detect these nascent assemblies within the cell. Importantly, whenever filagin is absent, both sensor A and sensor B are soluble. So unless there is a phase separation protein like filagin inside the cell, these sensors, as I predicted, as we designed them to be, are soluble. And I, I don't have time to go into it of how we validated these sensors, but I wanna show you now what we did with them. So because they're genetically encoded, uh, these are proteins that, that can be uh, encoded into very simple genetic constructs, we can put them inside antiviral vectors. And so here is an antiviral vector in which we have our sensor and a, a promoter, uh, and we use different kinds of promoter sequences. But these antiviral vectors also have an interesting trick, which is that they also carry silencing RNAs that we can use for knocking down for specific uh, mRNAs and eventually proteins. And we do these experiments by transducing embryos, these are mouse embryos, um, in utero, so that once they're born, they already carry our genetic constructs. So this is an embryo right before it's born, and you can see the skin now is fluorescing uh, strongly in green because it carries our sensor. Now, what does it look like? Uh, here's a live imaging view of a cross-section of the skin of this mouse. And, and again, this is what the skin looks in cross-sections, how you tell you. Uh, and you go from the basal, basal layer basal layer to the granular layer, you see that we expect to have these granules, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, so we do a, an optical sectioning of our live imaging data. You see that in the basal, there's really not much happening, but as you go towards the corneum, there's this strong signal that is co-localizing in, in spherical structures. And it's easier to see if we go planar, so if we take a planar view of the skin, particularly the different parts of the granular layer, so blue, orange, and, 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 and purple here, different sections. You see that early on, there's very few granules, middle and particularly towards the skin surface, these granules have grown tremendously. To us, this was really, really exciting to see. We did not expect to see such a dramatic event of phase separation in the skin. Uh, 
Now, of course, this is lab imaging, lab imaging data, so we can, we can do experiments and, and do this over time. So we, we first asked, well, you know, I think this goes back to one of the questions from, from the audience as to whether these granules were potentially going to go in fusion or not. And, and so here are sales. I want you to focus on this particular part of the video. And as I play it, you'll see that over the span uh, of over about half a day, uh, we don't really see much evidence of these granules coming together and fusing. That was really surprising to us. They are growing. And in fact, we can quantify this here on the right from zero minutes to 800 minutes. We do see that a given cell acquires new granules and some of the existing granules get much bigger. And we can even quantify that if you look at the normalized volume over the span of these 12 hours. I mean, there's a lot of growth in volume, but it's not, it's not really happening through fusion. So that was really puzzling to us because all of our previous experiments suggested that these were liquids in the cells, so how come they're not fusing? Well, one of the first things that we had to do was, well, let's probe the liquid-like behavior a bit. So our sensors, you know, as they're localized to these compartments, what well, we can do for photoblation experiments. So let's do a photoblation experiment and let's see what happens with the recovery. So if we quantify that, both for sensor A and sensor B, you know, the sensor ha half-life is only a few seconds, 1.5 seconds recovery. So these dynamics are very, very fast, right? So we bleach, and only two seconds later, there's almost recovery. These things are really mixing within those compartments. They're liquid-like, at least in their dynamics in internally. But these cells, as they mature, so here is a cell that goes from the early granular layer to the late, and you can see that their morphology changes and they acquire more and more granules. So we were intrigued to know if there was any sort of maturation of the material properties of these compartments. And so we started doing photovoltaic experiments in these different layers. And if you see at the early granular layer, the sensor reveals that they're very, very liquid-like. And this is where we start. And as they move towards the middle, particularly at the late stage, the viscosity, the relative viscosity keeps increasing as revealed by this lengthening of the FRAP recovery of half-life of the sensor. And intriguingly to us, if we were to compare our sensor behavior in the skin per se, in the mouse, versus what we were doing in vitro in our cell culture experiments, look at this difference. So the same sensor now deploying two different systems, uh, but really displaying very different dynamics. And so somehow in the skin per se, the granules are exhibiting a relative viscosity that is different. Now, this was in the mouse. So we said, well, maybe it's because we were now, we were prior, prior working with, with, with human uh, feed again. Well, we did these experiments with human cells as well. So this is uh, using a process of building uh, skin in the lab. And you can see that if we repeat the experiments both in the mouse or in the human skin, so not longer in cell culture, but rather building, trying to build human skin, we see very, very similar behaviors. So the viscosity of these keratohaline granules very much optimizes SIMS for the biological function in the context of the tissue. So just to summarize, uh, we now show that these kind of technologies, face separation sensors, can illuminate very intriguing dynamics of face separation in the skin. And remarkably, it points to the fact that even though these compartments may be thought of as being liquid-like, and they suddenly span a range of viscosities, they can indeed crowd the cytoplasm, uh, which we weren't expecting. We were expecting all these fusion events. And I don't have time to go into what we did to uncover some of the underpinnings of that crowding, but I'll mention that we uncovered that kerato, uh, keratin networks, so these are intermediate filament networks that exist in the skin, are particularly good at isolating the granules so that they don't fuse. So there is another network of filaments, keratins in this case, that are sort of in a tug of war with the, with the liquid-like behavior of the granules that allows them to be crowded in the cytoplasm of the cells. And we think that's important for the structure of the cytoplasm. So here, may, give me, let me give you a, a brief biophysical outlook of what's going on here. So we were intrigued by this crowding of the cytoplasm. And we now, I told you, you know, maybe keratins are playing a role there. But you know, you can think of the same as, you know, the keratins are being pushed out. They're certainly preventing the grounds from fusing, but they themselves are being pushed out. So perhaps there is an effect on the keratins themselves in their assembly. But think of our organelles as well. You know, there's the nucleus and the nucleus is losing space. Just, this is a the volume effect. And it's certainly true for other organelles that are membrane bound like mitochondria and others. So very intriguing to think about the consequences of this crowding that we see in the skin because of these liquid like compartments in the cell. But I wanted to draw your attention to one particular really intriguing aspect of the skin, which is that the skin is, is unique uh, with, with a few other tissues in that when it goes from the stem cell state to the very surface and the full differentiation state, the cells actually lose their nucleus. So they have to lose their nucleus when they go from the granule layer to the corneum. And we thought that there was a good chance that this crowding and this particular uh, liquid-like granules in the, in the skin perhaps were playing a role in this nucleation step. 
So we Excuse me, to... uh, there is a question. Uh, can you please repeat what's the implication or use of LLPs inside tissue? Yeah. So I think that that's what I'm trying to get at now. So yes. what I've shown you so far is that we see signs of liquid liquid separation in the skin, but I haven't yet told you, uh, you know, why we think that's important. And that's what I'm about to do. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, thought, started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we thought that we thought that enucleation could be a potential way in which this grounds were playing an important role. And that's because we noticed that, that if you were to image, so this is imaging skin, this is an image from the mouse skin as it's being developed, as it's developing. And if we image with a red tag on, 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 a, on a chromatin protein, H2B, together with our sensors, we noticed that whenever the nucleation was just beginning, and, and there we see signs of initial compaction of the chromatin, we then see immediate signs of, of loss of sensor signal from within this compartment. And so you go from having nice phase separation to having signs of, of, of a different phase separation state in which there is a loss of that uh, phase separation dynamic. And so over the span of only just 200 minutes, you know, you see there is a complete remodeling of these cells. So you go from the granular state into what we, we know is, a, is this squam state or these dead cells that are at the surface of the skin. So here an implication for a, a coupling of the dynamics of the liquid liquid phase separation, phase separation dynamics in the skin with a process enucleation that we know is important for skin biology. Now, is that really happening and why would it be important? So here what I'm showing you is, this is normal skin in the mouse. Uh, using a control helping RNA that is not targeting anything. You see beautiful phase separation. But whenever we use our lentiviral constructs to also knock down filagrin, then we will lose that phase separation behavior. So here's a case where we create a mouse skin depleted of filagrin and we see no signs of phase separation. So what's the consequence of that, we asked. And the first thing that we noticed was that if you look at H2BRFP, so the nuclear signal in our experiment, Within you know, two to four hours in the control case, there is complete loss of that signal. But whenever we depleted phase separation by depleting filagrin, we then see a lengthening of that, of that process. So no longer this removal of the nucleus is very effective or very, or, or very efficient. Um, so that was the first sign that perhaps phase separation was playing an important role in controlling the, the process of enucleation. And more specifically, we measure an important uh, outcome of, of the skin barrier function, which is the, the barrier quality as measured by, uh, by water loss. So this is TEWL. Yes, so Felipe, we, we have like uh, eight minutes before you have to conclude. Sounds good, we're getting there. This is a trans transepidermal water loss. So this is a measure of how much water is lost in the skin. And so in the scramble case, you see that, you know, there's this baseline value, but if you deplete, feel like in loose phase separation, suddenly the skin that you get is is a lot of water that is being lost. So not only we're seeing a lengthening of this loss of the nucleus, but we're also losing, seeing a loss of this very quality as measured by the water loss that we can measure. And so this is just an overview, you know, we started thinking, you know, what are the potential mechanisms for this? Uh, how could the phase separation be important for the loss of the nuclear in the skin? And we did notice that wild type type filagrin was very good at deforming the nucleus. So here on the left, and whenever we see mutations that are, you know, that we, we know are associated with tropic dermatitis, those resulting compartments, even if they form, they're not very good at deforming the nucleus. So there was this aspect of, of, of crowding and deformation of the nucleus that we thought was important that we also would see in the skin of the mouse. But what we would always see, however, uh, very consistently was this sinking, as I mentioned, of the dynamics of, of the sensor within these granules and the nucleation process. Could it be then that the things that might be sequestered during, in, inside these compartments are released at the right time to orchestrate a process of enucleation. So perhaps this liquid light dynamics, this very sort of uh, if, uh, dynamic uh, phase separation driven events being very good at actuating a biological process like enucleation. And we thought that uh, there was a chance that this was perhaps happening, this sinking of phase separation and enucleation might be happening because of a pH responsiveness. And I mentioned very early on that one of the si uh, signature features of of phase separation is its stimulant responsive behavior. So the skin surface is actually acidic, uh, it's about 5.5 in humans, and there's a suspected a pH grain that goes all the way to the basal layer of the skin. And this is intriguing because the transition point, which would be expected to happen somewhere in the granular layer, will be around 6.5, which happens to be the pKa of histidine, which I mentioned is one of the most abundant aromatic residues in filagrin. So it really got us thinking into, hey, could it be that filagrin is actually optimized to sense a pH shift in the skin, to then actuate the process of you know, creation. So this is very quickly just showing you cells. We, we went to this first in vitro where we have cells co-expressing sensors and filagrin at pH 
uh, they co-localize beautifully, but if we then change the pH intracellularly um, in our experiment, then we see that it is a granulatic sort of disassembly of the granules, and we see both ejection of filaggin and of the sensors from within those granules in a pH responsive manner. And this is actually, if we play with the pH range, we see that this is happening precisely at pH 6.3, which is again the PK of histidine. So it does seem that these granules are optimized for sensing pH. Now, that, that's not saying that skin actually has that pH shift. So we wanted to test that. And we uh, went to pH reporters that are genetically encoded, and we had two, a red one and a green one, and we put those into genetically engineered mice. And what we see here is this is, again, imaging data from mouse a skin in which we have a pH reported in red and sensor in green. And this is T equals zero, both are in the same cell. But just 20 minutes later, you see that the pH went to basically very low, about, uh, we suspect about 6.3. There's, uh, these sensors work by uh, a loss in fluorescent signal. And so you no longer see a signal from the, from the reporter, pH reporter. And the same can be, can be seen from the other angle if you look at a, a pH report that is green, so there is plenty of fluorescence, the chromatin is intact, uh, a pH shift leads to a loss of pH uh, uh, of signal from the pH sensor reporter. And now you see that there is no longer a, pH, a signal from the reporter, so indicative of a pH shift, but the chromatin is still not compacted. Now, 20 minutes later, plenty of compaction of the chromatin and these onset of enucleation. So pointing to the fact that there is a pH shift intracellular in the, intracellular in the skin that is upstream of both enucleation and the changes in, in, in LLPS dynamics that we were predicting were important for enucleation. And we actually tested that directly by playing with the pH in skin. And so here is a controlled skin in which we have pH 7.4 in our media. And when we shift the pH of the whole skin to 6.4, you see there is a dramatic compaction of the chromatin but when we do these experiments now in the context of genetically modified mouse skin that lacks filaggrin, so lacks a lot of these compartments in the cells that are transduced with these antiviruses, we see that even a pH shift is unable to trigger a lot of compaction. So again, pointing to the fact that there is a, a strong argument for pH shift being upstream of the, of the triggering of new uh, phase separation dynamics that then lead to the enucleation process. And so this is just a summary in which uh, I just, uh, show you that we uncovered really intriguing phase separation dynamics in the skin. As cells move towards the surface, there's this beautiful process of phase separation that then eventually leads to a assembly step that we think is important for the uh, formation of the surface of the skin. And we think that these dynamics are actuated in an environmental responsive manner so that a pH shift at the granular layer stage enables these liquid-like domains within the cell to then disassemble likely actually in the process of enucleation. Of course, there are many questions that remain. I mean, we're very intrigued by other kinds of stimuli. We mentioned pH, but you know, the skin is at the surface of, uh, it's at the interface with the environment, so temperature could be a trigger. How is it that forces might be impacting on the liquid behavior of these structures? Um, and so a lot of these questions are things that we are very interested in continuing to study. What are those environmental stimuli and how do they interact with the keratolohyan granules? We haven't yet uncovered what are the components within those compartments that are released uh, at the critical stage of enucleation to then actuate the process. And of course, because these are strongly linked to disease, we're very interested in thinking about can we target these phase separation dynamics that we uncover in the skin to then think about new therapies for skin bed disorders. So then this brings me towards the end of the talk and, and I won't have time to go into a lot of the non equilibrium stuff, but I, I do wanna very briefly touch upon that because I think I have a few minutes. And I'll just say that because phase separation in the context of the skin, in the context of tissues and cells, is of course fueled by a lot of uh, dynamics that consume energy. It's obvious to begin thinking that a lot of the things that we're gonna see in the cell are not necessarily under equilibrium, but perhaps are in an unequilibrium state. And so in fact, when we began to very you know, quickly look at these processes, uh, if we go back to the libraries of extensive kinds of polymers that we made over the years that are IDP in nature, and we begin to sort of look at their face suppression behavior uh, over multiple cycles of phase separation to, to begin to probe the, the equilibrium dynamics, we can actually see already three kinds of behaviors, at least for the, LCS, the polymers that excuse LCST behavior. And, and this is a bit busy, but it's easy to follow. If you go to the blue example, the, the full circles are at the heating cycle and the cooling circles are at the open circles. And you'll see that once you heat and cool, these polymers go back right away into solution. But if you look now to the second example, the one in red, you see that when you heat, there is phase separation, but then when you cool, they actually take a long time to go back. And then if you go to a third example, there is even more of what we call hysteresis, this difference in the behavior between heating and cooling. So that for the green example, once you heat, there is phase separation, 
but once you cool, there is actually very little signs of, of reversibility. And, and we've been sort of parsing out a lot of the underpinnings of these different kinds of, of, of hysterectomy behaviors in, in IDPs. Um, and we think these behaviors are highly reproducible, so really tools that we could begin to use to examine phase separation in engineer systems to, to harness these behaviors for new nanostructures, the assembly of new nanostructures. But we think that these kinds of behaviors might also be playing a role in orchestrating the complexity of the dynamics that might be happening in the context of tissues. So I don't have to go into the details of this, um, but I'll just, I'll just leave you with an example where if you think of even nanostructures, uh, these are dibloco polymers that are made from either non hysteretic polymers or hysteretic polymers, you can begin to assemble really intriguing nanostructures where uh, you know, they, they, they assemble. So the data is shown here that the RH data is in, in, in orange. So this is uh, hydro, uh, DLS data, light scattering data to measure the size of the particles. This is about a 100 nanometer particle in size. They're actually not, they're monomers initially. So follow the orange uh, diamonds. They go at high temperatures into this assembly state, about 100 nanometer inside nanostructures. But as you cool down below the original assembly temperature, you see that the particles don't disassemble and they remain stable for a long regime of that temperature range because of this hysteria behavior. However, at very low temperatures, they might go back. And this is interesting because you know, we've, we've seen that they assemble into very defined nanostructures. Uh, here at rod like that we can see through cryo TEM. These are different, different that the morphology that we've seen in a lot of our examples with the more his, non hysteric polymers that we built in the past. So we think that by accessing these kinds of non equilibrium behaviors, we'll begin to lock the nanostructures in very intriguing and potentially biomedically useful nanomorphologies. And, and, and we have to begin to exploit these dynamics uh, to encode new biological uh, behaviors. Uh, and we think that that could be potentially also happening in the context of the cells in natural occurring IDPs as well. So overall, I think I, I hope I give you a flavor of, of how we now have sequence heuristics to encode and tune these behaviors in IDPs. Um, we can use these behaviors to then tune self-assembly uh, of these cancer protein polymers. Uh, I think it's really exciting to just see so many examples of how phase separation goers intersect our self-assembly. And particularly in the context of the skin, it seems to be at the root of both the skin barrier formation and barrier disorders. And I think a skin, we, what we just show you, is, is, is skin as a nice and beautiful system to study phase separation question and dynamics in the context of tissues. And I think two major assigning questions moving forward are the fact that we still need new tools to be able to probe these dynamic behaviors in the context of the tissue biology. I show you this big difference between our experiments in cell culture versus what we actually in that I've discovered in the context of the skin tissue itself. So really we need tools to be able to probe these behaviors in tissues. And, and moving forward, I think that uh, we'll have to do much more towards understanding uh, these non equilibrium dynamics in the context of IDPs and still in the context of the cell because uh, we know cellular mechanisms are driven by a lot of um, ATP, are ATP driven in nature in many cases. And, and, and these kinds of, of, of um, differences between equilibrium systems and non equilibrium will have to be taken into account to really fully uncover the complexities that we see in biology. So, with that, I want to acknowledge you know, this is work that I've done over the years in many different places, uh, certainly at Duke. Uh, I want to acknowledge the, the contributions of, of my mentor, Shida Shukati, one of our collaborators at NC State, Yara Yingling. Um, a lot of the work was done, uh, particularly the skin work was done in the lab of uh, Elaine Fuchs, a Rockefeller University. Uh, I want to acknowledge Vince Fiori, who uh, is a biomedical engineer with an expertise in mechanobiology. He was instrumental to work on using AFM to probe these behaviors in skin. Um, and John Lewis, who conducted a lot of the in vivo work looking at this lentiviral transduction of, of mice to create this. Um, interesting systems to look at phase separation in skin, and my lab uh, at uh, Georgia Tech Emory, uh, who are following up on a lot of these intriguing findings that we have in the context of the skin, but also in the context of the developing new tools, particularly to probe phase separation in tissue biology. So with that, we have a few minutes for more questions. Happy to answer those. Uh, thank you for your attention, um, and I look forward to interacting. Thank you very much, uh, Felipe, for such an interesting talk. Uh, uh, I will ask if anyone has any questions in the audience. All right, well, uh, we are waiting for incoming questions. I have a few questions of my own. So uh, what is the role of viscosity? So um, you said that there are filaments that prevent uh, granules from fusing uh, as one of uh, mechanism that prevents uh, fusion of uh, granules, but what is the role of viscosity in this uh, separation of granules? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And um, so far, 
so I'll give you a, a bit of a long answer. So far, people have been thinking about this idea of liquids and, and their viscosity perhaps going into a less a highly viscous state, perhaps a solid-like state, and thinking of that as some sort of like pathological transition. Uh, this is true, particularly in the context of, of, of new degeneration, where people have been seeing for a long time aggregates within the cell that are solid-like. Uh, in our context, uh, we're seeing something slightly different. We're seeing that there's, that there's a tuning of the viscosity as cells mature and move towards the surface. Um, and we're also seeing that in people with mutations, the viscosity is highly reduced. And so in our case, at least, uh, we have evidence to suggest that the viscosity is being tuned. We think that this viscosity likely plays a role in these interactions with the other organelles, like the nucleus. I mentioned the deformation of the nucleus. So you can imagine that you, know, you need sufficient viscosity to begin to sort of have these deformation events or push in other parts of the cell away. Uh, but we certainly haven't uh, figured out in detail you know, what is the specific viscosity that is needed or why is that viscosity so important? But I think that the, the emerging evidence that we have is that, is that the, the question in, in physical separation biology is not as simple as liquids versus solids versus, you know, something in between, but rather that the system might be optimized to hit very specific ranges of viscosity for functions that we still are not completely clear. Uh, something that I will add as well is that I mentioned the disassembly of the granules and the actuation of what might be released from those compartments to then trigger enucleation and other events that have to happen. Well, you can imagine that the viscosity will also control the timing of the dynamics, right? If, they are, if, the, if the viscosity is very low, perhaps things are released too fast. If the viscosity mm -hmm. is much higher, perhaps the solution is slower. So we haven't measured those things, but it, it makes sense to start thinking about that viscosity as being a tuner of the dynamics itself. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, I will go with another one uh, myself. So, uh, what about uh, so the nucleus in this uh, model? Uh, that, sorry for my ignorance, is considered as a, um, a bubble, is a basically liquid uh, state of uh, in liquid bubble. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, uh, do you have an idea like uh, what is actually happens when these uh, granules releasing? something what is actually it is it a chemical reaction a physical chemical reaction that the uh, yeah. leads to the enucleation yeah no that's an excellent question so what we're focused on right now is so beyond this biophysical aspect of of how there might be the formation of the nucleus um i do think that there needs to be a focus on what are those components from within those because we know the, the composition is heterotypic i mean i'm showing you there's a lot of phylogen present inside them that's not to say there is nothing else inside them. We suspect there is a lot more inside them. Um, now, it is very tricky to figure out what's inside of them. And the reason for that is that for these kinds of organelles or components within the cell, because they're membraneless, so they don't have a lipid membrane, it's not as simple as break the cell apart and purify these things and figure out what's inside. It's actually very hard to study. Um, however, there is an emerging um, set of tools uh, which is are generally known as proximity-dependent proteomics. And what they entail is the idea that you can specifically label the proteins within those compartments before you break the cell apart. And you particularly label them with biotin. And so, you know, biotin is, is, is one of our favorite uh, tools to use in, in biotechnology. So once you label specifically within the compartment, the protein or the components of the compartment with biotin, you don't worry if this assembly is gonna happen. You break the cells apart, you break the tissue apart, and then you purify those biotin label proteins, and then you do proteomics work to see who was within the proximity of the compartment. So those kinds of tools are the ones that we're developing now to specifically address the question of, hey, who is present in the compartment prior to this assembly? And I think that will give us the map of the biomolecular composition, which will say, we expect there will be proteases and DNases and, and players that you know, are known to be present in the skin and playing a role in, bio, in the biology of the skin, but that are known not known to localize to a granule. And it's, again, very hard to study this particular part of the skin because the specific architecture of the skin, immunohistomic chemistry is not particularly good either. Um, but I think pro proximity-dependent proteomics um, are gonna work well. And I'm happy to say that the tools that we have with the face separation sensors, we have adapted them to that kind of proteomics work. So we really are very close to being to, able to get that data, but we don't have it yet. So what are those molecules that are being released that are actually in the process? I would love to know, we'll know soon. All right, let's hope we'll know soon. <laughs> uh, all right.
If there are no questions from the audience, uh, we are actually a bit overdue. Mm, no. Michael, thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. You. And if anyone has any questions uh, or, you know, think of questions after the talk, and certainly once you look at the recorded seminar, I know I can go uh, a bit faster with the, uh, of different aspects of the work. Please email me. I'm happy to, to interact and answer questions and, and get you inspired about thinking from a physics perspective and quantitative perspective of opportunities in this field. So I hope some of you do, do join. All right. Thank you very much.